Hello, welcome to another of our weekly Sunday Science Q and A's. Today's Sunday Science Q and A is brought to you by our sponsor, Cocodamol, uh, because uh, I had a molar pulled out uh, three days ago, and they didn't bother telling me. Oh, yeah, you will have two weeks of stabbing pain. So we're going to find out. This is one of the little kind of science experiments we'd like to do. Is Cocodamol a performance enhancing drug for me? Presenting a live Sunday Science Q and A. Um, I really wanted to show you the two as well unfortunately it was thrown away i did ask them to keep it because i know that from all of the kind of weird ratcheting around that i had to do in my mouth it really was a warning to all of you to please look after your teeth to avoid becoming me um there are other ways that unfortunately might lead to becoming me as well but i'm not going to go through all of those things the whole nature <laughs> nurture, genetics things a lot of problems there anyway today is uh a very um well they're all i find all of these exciting because i always learn something new and you always send in great questions um but today we are doing uh because it is only 94 uh, lecturing days before the uh, RI Christmas lectures, so, you know, countdown to those scientific information moments, uh, we have all three of the people who, in fact, I think, am I right? There may be a four, I think it's, um, Helen Chersky, you're, you're, I'm going to go straight to you early now. Uh, Helen, by the way, is coming live from Dorset. Helen, is it three or is there a fourth person as well doing a Christmas lecture? Uh, it's just the three. It's just the three of us. It Unless is the three. Someone's <laughs> really keeping something in the dark to hide from all of us. <laughs> I, I wanted to double check. Yes, it is. So we have Christmas lectures, uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the way it's being done this year and uh, why it is. I think, uh, and I, I certainly know Helen agrees. Uh, I don't know about another uh, other guests. Why it is a, a good thing to see science being presented in a way which is not a solitary individual talking about science, but again, that kind of sense of uh, the need for uh, collective thought as well. So uh, anyway, so we're doing a Christmas lecture special. Uh, by the way, the Christmas lecture's title this year is Planet Earth, A User's Guide. Uh, and we are going to be joined by, as well as Helen, uh, we're also going to be joined by Chris Jackson and Tara Shine. Uh, I'll mention a few things before I introduce them. One is we have a tip jar somewhere on this screen. And uh, if you are able to uh, pop in, uh, you know, if you do have any money that you think yeah, you know, well, uh, scientific knowledge, I, I'm, I'm prepared to pay a small amount for that, then that's very useful to us because, of course, for many of us involved in all of the cosmic shambles things at the moment, uh, our livelihood no longer uh, exists at this current time because uh, all of the tools that we were doing etc um, are gone but we want to try and keep making as much stuff online as possible and if you are able to support us that's fantastic if you're able to support us uh, with a regular contribution by going to uh, Patreon that is absolutely magnificent as well but also as much as possible we try and make sure that everything is also free to access online every now and again there are certain things where you do need to have Patreon subscription but that is basically it's the only model that we can do to, to just just keep uh, being able to to make stuff and uh, of course that's very important as well for our producer Trent Burton who does nearly all of the work uh, basically the behind the scenes work is a huge amount of work goes on um, I should mention as well as we're talking uh, about financial problems going on at the moment uh, that the uh, the Royal Institute as well is uh, Royal Institute is uh, an independent charity uh, and doesn't receive any public funding from the government and so they also are in need of donations at the moment they are in quite a kind of uh, uh, a, a tricky position uh, all the information about the christmas lectures is on the royal institute of the ri site and uh again we'll have links to all of these things if you want to ask questions live then you can just tweet us at cosmic shambles on twitter just at cosmic shambles uh, episode two of the atlantis series with lucy green and chris hadfield is out now and we're back with another genetic shambles we're doing a, a fortnightly show about genetics uh and that's every wednesday and we're back at uh 8 30 with jenny roan uh lavanya main and uh and susie White miles uh there, that's pretty much it. There we go. That's that's all the homework done. Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to join Helen first of all. Helen, I know that you've obviously you you as usual on a Sunday have um, cycled a distance that most people have not travelled in six months. And uh, have you got a show and tell for us? I do. So, so just some context to this. Um, I'm in I'm in Dorset because I've been my little escape has turned into touring cycling. So I've been dealing with the hills of Dorset, which has been enormous fun this morning. Um, so this is my show and tell. How, how close it focus now? I am not. Well, focus very close up. Can you see it's like it's a shell made of silver? Mm. Yeah. Um, now, 
the reason I have this is that um, probably 10 years ago now, I was doing fieldwork uh, in the Antarctic. I left from uh, the Falkland Islands. And the Falkland Islands, if you haven't been there, are an interesting place for many reasons. One of them is that they're obsessed with penguins to the point that their, their local newspaper is called the Penguin Press or something like that. And um, so when I left, uh, when I was there in the fault lines, I had a few days and the ship was getting ready to go. And I thought I need, I should have something. I should take, you know, a souvenir from the fault lines. So I went to all the shops and they had penguin everything. They had penguin toe straps, they had penguin um, tea <laughs> coaters, they had penguin, you name it, they had a penguin one. And then I found this one shop and I'm not really a jewelry person. And they were selling these. And what this is, it's it's a shell that is um, modeled from something just offshore off the Falkland Islands. And they had a whole range in the shop of jewelry that was solid silver, but every single one was, was a specific from the ocean right next to the Falkland. And it's really inching ocean around there. And so, sorry, it's moving a bit. But I thought, what a nice way to be reminded of the ocean. I mean, it's not that I don't like penguins and I did get a plush toy penguin as well, but, um, I thought that was such a lovely idea to remind people of what's in the ocean just by having basic, because it's so beautiful, it's so beautiful, you can make jewellery out of it. And so I, I've always thought that person, the Falkland Island, should get more credit for not being a penguin fan, even though everybody <laughs> else in the Falklands are competing to be the biggest penguin fans in the world. Anyway, so that's my show and turn. I love that. I love the it's idea something. that you should be reminded about the oceans because in terms of one person I know who never forgets the oceans on anything that we've ever done, you are that person. Um, we're also joined by uh, Tara Shine. Hello, Tara. Hi, how, how are you doing? doing? Thanks, Thanks for having me on. on. Well, we're so glad. I mean, it is, uh, I just before, uh, can I just check, by the way, do you have a show and tell? I do. I have one ready. And Brilliant. I am just out of the sea. So I, I am covering all the bases. <laughs> Excellent. Now, this this it seems to be a very... Uh, exciting and interesting year for the christmas lectures this idea of you go you know you're, you're you're working together and why do you think it is or do you think it's important that this is a kind of change to what we've seen of the, of the traditions which is you know going going back what 170 how many it's 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 well over a century isn't it the christmas lectures we we, we 18... 180 i think is it 1820 yeah. almost 200 years but not quite i think yeah this is a change yeah, I think it's. I yeah, think, I it's, think great. it's great. I think it's great. Um, I think because it gives us an opportunity to think about the whole system and how the systems of planet Earth work together. I remember when I was doing my PhD, which I did on some ephemeral wetlands in West Africa in a country called Mauritania, and uh, even at the time of my viva most of the questioning was taken up with, but why didn't you study one beetle that lived in these wetlands? Because <laughs> I'm not interested in the one beetle in the wetlands. I want to understand the entire system, how these wetlands interact and work with the desert that surrounds them and the people that live there and the migratory birds that come through, because that to me is fascinating, the system, how the system works. And I think what the three of us are excited about too is the fact that we get to use these Christmas lectures to paint a more holistic picture of the different types of science that help us understand how the planet works and that it's no one element that can explain all this. We, it's, we have to work together to understand this amazing system that is, is there and that is our life support system. So, yeah, I think it's fantastic. I, I think it's great. I mean, I but should suppose, was a, 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 was a, not not quite as far as this, but I think was it two years ago when when Ethan Lysa and and uh, Alice Roberts did did uh, uh, their series about evolution together. So I th that seems to be like the start of, of uh, I think a very healthy change to see, and that, they were fantastic lectures as well. So Tara, what are you going to uh, show and tell today? Or today, I really well, struggle. The last time. Oh, oh go on, go on, Helen. Helen, have you got another show and tell? Say, no, no, no. I was just going to say the last. Going to say the last time they had more than one lecture in a year, apart from Alice and Eva, was in the um, International Geophysical Year in 1957, I think. So they have done it before, but they apparently only do it for the Earth, which is appropriate, but just worth noting. <laughs> I think. The whole universe—that's just one person yeah. needed. The Earth. We'll need more somewhere along the line. There's some strange. I, I suppose that's the nature of physics, isn't it? Physics, in the end, is a very singular pursuit. Can I? Oh, can I get? Can I? No, oh, can I get? Can I get my other bee on my bee in my bonnet out of the way here? Sorry, Tara. Um, so <laughs> astronomy. They have done the lectures on astronomy literally twenty times, and the last time the only Earth science they've done before was that in 1839 there was a lecture called the Chemistry of the Atmosphere and the Ocean. So that's Tara and me. And then in 1995, Chris Jackson, uh, James Jackson, 
James Jackson, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's confusing. <laughs> Did um, the planet Earth thing, which I loved. But, you know, it's been a long time. But they did astronomy 20 times. Well, Tara, that was a lovely show and tell. Your show and tell was Helen's Bees and Bonnet. Uh, Tara, what's, uh, what is your show and tell? I've never met Helen in person, and already I love the bees in her bonnet. So, <laughs> um, so my show and tell is, I struggled. There were so many things that it could have been. So anyway, I've ended up with this. I have a whole bundle of these things around my desk. So this is my uh, badge that let me into COP21 in Paris in 2015. And to get into these climate change negotiations, you have to have one of these and it's checked multiple times. And I guess they're one of the only things that you take away from you from, from the whole experience, apart from being really tired and wrecked and haggard by the end of it. And either really, really sad as I was leaving Copenhagen or pretty damn happy as I was leaving Paris. Um, but if you see, this badge has got all these flowers attached to it. So this one is from Palau and this one is from uh, Fiji. Um, and that's because the job that we were doing in, in Paris was to try and make sure that we got an agreement that was true to science, but that would also protect the most vulnerable people um, on our planet, the most people most vulnerable to climate change. And so um, there was a lot of work done together by scientists, and indigenous people and Pacific Islanders and people living in least developed countries to make a case for their, the goal, the global goal, the temperature goal that we would set to be um, below two degrees and to pursue 1.5. And getting that into this piece of paper was one of the most monumental efforts ever. Um, it was a, because it was, this is politics, it's high politics, this is geopolitics, every country in the world is represented, they send some of their best negotiators and you hammer it out over a two week period. Um, but what really helped to get the 1.5 degree goal was a really good bit of science um, discussion that happened in the preceding years in a thing called a structured expert dialogue. We give things the most boring name <laughs> in, the, um, in the climate change convention, but the idea was to review the global goal and say, what is a safe temperature goal to set? And up until then, we thought two degrees was pretty safe and we would just aim for that. And that would be kind of the, the mark um, that we would aim for. And we would all reduce our emissions enough to keep warming below two degrees, two, 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 two degrees. But anyway, the work that happened in the structured expert dialogue, bringing all of the latest science into a discussion that was outside the politics of the negotiations, um, it, it, it came up with a really clear findings that two degrees was not safe and that instead we needed to go for close as we could get to 1.5, particularly for people that lived in the Pacific Islands, the least developed countries, coastal, low-lying coastal countries, that if they were to have any chance at life, we had to go for 1.5. And so it's one of these unique examples of where we managed to get the politicians and the negotiators to stop in a highly political process and listen to the science. It was a great piece of science communication because this report that the Structured Expert Dialogue and the review of the Global Goals did actually spoke in plain English. So its report had 10 key messages that were written in plain English that just said two, things like two degrees is not safe. Like that's easy to understand. <laughs> Um, so anyway, then we were able to translate that into then what was this magnificent moment where we got 1.5 degrees, uh, below, well below 2 degrees, pursuing 1.5 as the goal that was set in the Paris Agreement. Um, and that was a really, really happy day for any climate scientist. And I'd been in this process for years through all the highs and lows. I remember I came home and I was all delighted with myself and it was just before Christmas and, um, you know, we had a new legally binding international agreement and I was thrilled. But... Uh, that's not what anybody wanted to talk to me about. Sure, people were talking about Christmas, but they're still like, we still don't understand what you do, Tara. Like, what is your job? <laughs> it's so unplanned. And what do you do? And what, yeah, it's just so far removed from everybody. And if anything, I thought, how am I going to, if we're really going to get to 1.5, I have to find a way to connect with these men and women, mums and dads on my street. You know, the mums and dads are my kids' friends. If I can't start to be able to communicate to them why this is important, we're not getting anywhere. And so... From then on, I started to shift my attention while still working at the international level to working more around kind of also the role of individuals and trying to figure out how we would engage people who do not think they're green, who don't think they're a climate activist, who will never join Extinction Rebellion, but make them part of this conversation and this effort 
to get to 1.5 so we can create this kind of systemic change that that we did and anyway as part of my um, as part of my effort on that I wrote a, I wrote a book about individual actions and objects last year called how to save your planet one object at a time which is all around trying to democratize the effort we need to make to get to 1.5 so everybody can feel part of it and so that finally now I am pleased to say in 2020 despite the pandemic my neighbors and people down the street actually have a better idea of like what I do. <laughs> Brilliant. That is, <laughs> we, we'll make sure there's a link to that book uh, as well uh, on, on, underneath this, uh, this, this <laughs> book you. so people know about that. This is now, now, now our next guest, this excites me because when you pulled out your pass, he immediately stood up and went somewhere. I thought, is this going to be Lanyard? Thought, is this going to be Lanyard? Has he gone, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, that's, that's a Lanyard, that's a Lanyard, you wait till you see my Lanyard. <laughs> so Chris Jackson, it is lovely to have you uh, back on. You were on one of the very early Sunday Sunday q and a's i think good good four four months back uh with a fantastic uh container filled with all manner of intriguing rocks um what have you got for us today what have you got for us today hi um yeah um, thanks for having me on again i've got another rock so <laughs> and this one's not attached to a lanyard so it's not lanyard walls today because i can't oh, see that, that. Just threw it at <laughs> it's not really we don't get on the necklace. I we don't go around waving our rocks at each other. No, it's uh, <laughs> it's even we don't do that. No, it's a very impressive lanyard. No, mine's a rock again, but I think this is a very beautiful rock and it's very topical and it's a recently collected piece of rock. So this is actually a garnet bearing metamorphic rock from what's called the Western Nice region of uh, Western Norway. So just um, pick this up in Son Sonjafjord, just north of where I'm sitting here. And the reason I picked this is because if we can, you know, the, 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 the Royal Institution of Christmas Lecture is about climate change. And one question I've been asked a lot since it's been announced is why on earth do geology care about climate change and what can they possibly contribute to the discussion around climate change? And one really important thing about climate change is understanding the longer term context of what's going on now. So we can have a sense as to what the future might look like. And all of that record is contained in the rocks and the fossils of animals that used to live in deep earth or deep time tens to hundreds of millions of years ago. So why does that rock matter that I'm holding here? Well, if we can look at the chemistry of some of these uh, rock, these minerals in here, and especially the garnets, we can work out where they formed. So we can actually work out that rocks like these were formed in the roots of mountain belts, but these are very old mountain belts, hundreds of millions of years old. But I picked this up next to a fjord on, in modern day Norway. But by looking at the composition of the rocks in a really super nerdy but interesting way, we can start to move the Earth's plates around and actually understand what the Earth looked like a long time ago. And therefore, when we're looking at fossil record, let's say, we have a sense as to where those animals were living in terms of their relationship to what we now know as the modern climatic belts. So a lot about climate change is, controlled, is contained in these small minerals. It doesn't seem like it, but it's the foundation of a lot of what we would want to understand about what might happen in the future. So I thought this nice piece of rock, which I collected two weeks ago on holiday, actually can tell us a lot about climate change. That's it. That's beautiful. This interests me. One deal is that the the whole big history project, which uh, David Christian is uh, amongst others, and it does seem that there is. Is it a problem the fact that we have history? which just takes us back to a certain point in civilization, And then the history of our earth, the history of life, the history of everything becomes science. And that to me seems to create an awkward divide because that's what I love about big history is big history says, hang on a minute, let's actually take history is also, you know, it's, it's like that beautiful thing of talking about astronomy as being archaeology because astronomy is looking back in time. The moment we look in, and it, and it does seem to me that what you were just showing there, that is a historical artifact. It is, isn't it? It's. I've never thought about it. I've never thought about it that way. It's very true, though, isn't it? I guess the written record and the oral record is so immediate to everyone, more or less, to varying degrees. But then, as soon as we go into, we need a fancy machine to look at these minerals, or we need to look at um, these rocks which have this very cryptic record of earth history in them it becomes more the province of specialists maybe that's what we're thinking about here is it's the human story isn't it because when as soon as humans turn up then it becomes history but historians use loads loads of science i mean they carbon date things there's all this they they, they use a lot of scientific techniques i think if you speak to the people who look at you know even art history they look at the science of the pigments but maybe it's that they're looking for the human story and so in a way history is a discipline thinks that lens it's an interesting it's a really interesting comparison 
but it's very <laughs> anthropocentric. I hadn't thought about the entire <laughs> subject basically being anthropocentric by design. Um, and it's almost yeah. like a separate thing. It is, yeah. I just think it helps with that sense of connection to, to actually go. There's not a point where you go, and now history begins because we've started putting notches on a stick or we've painted on a wall. You know, that history of humanity goes back. Uh, anyway, we can go on about, well, I can go on about this for ages because I'm on Kokodamol and I don't know where it's going to go. Anyway, so <laughs> let's get to the first question, which is uh, from Gareth Bellamy. This is a long question, so uh, um, I'm, I'm going to throw this to you, Chris, first. But everyone, is, as usual, the normal rules are, Tara, I know you've not been on before. For anyone else who you know, if you want to join in, if you want to add anything, etc., that's if you want to sometimes hand over a question as well, that's all great. Uh, so, uh, Gareth says, uh, Hello, sorry, not a particularly serious question, but perhaps a timely one. As a former geology student, I seem to spend about half my degree up a mountain somewhere, either alone or in small groups. So, at the time when uh, how to teach safety <laughs> is high on the agenda, surely geology is one of the few subjects that comes with a large amount of social distancing based in so on top of the subjects of the ri christmas lectures general increasing awareness of the importance of the understanding of climate and the planet we should expect a big uptake in those studying earth scientists sciences see the world study the planet avoid the plague so that's kind of a quite lengthy uh chris what's your reaction to that to that i'm, I'm gonna start printing t-shirts and selling them through the geological society of london website I think, because I think that <laughs> it should just say bug of volcanoes on the front and then on the back it'll have that message. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's true. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, more seriously, field based geoscience is a small component of geosciences, right? So it's one thing you can do and one thing you might want to do. But there's a lot of stuff that happens in labs where you'll be sitting in the lap of somebody else or in a very cramped classroom. So and that's what's beautiful about geosciences is it happens in lots of different places, remote mountainsides as readily as in a very cramped lab. So basically, if, 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 if the here. core of your desire academic is, is primarily to be a hermit, geology is still not <laughs> necessarily, though, though caves may be involved, it's still not, you know, poetry is still the uh, the number one thing. <laughs> right, in terms of being yes. a hermit. Go on, There's something really important here about experiential science, right, which is that the worst thing that could happen in some ways for the future of humanity is that scientists become the type of hermit that sits in the lab rather than the type of hermit that goes out into the field. And it's really important. Like one of the things we worry about is that humans, I worry about a lot, is that, you know, it's easy, the satellite data and there's things and it's almost like a computer game. Um, and I, I worry that science could become very distant from the experience of being in the natural environment. And, you know, as field, all three of us are field scientists and you, there is no doubt you see stuff in the field that you didn't expect that lets you take the science forward in a way that you couldn't have done if you were just looking at data. So actually, I, I wish that more scientific subjects had. So it, you know, in ocean sciences, we do do a bit less. The field trips aren't quite as common, but there is a little bit of that. But I feel that science should be out in the field. All of it should be out in the field, at least a little, little bit. If you go, the only thing you see is the inside of a lab. Someone's gone wrong somewhere because that might be data but it's not science done by humans and i think we need to get back to that and and it's getting pushed away you know labs are expensive and workshops are expensive and going on field trips is expensive even though the geologists seem to have all the fun the fun um they definitely have all the tea breaks and they get drunk more than um they're the sociable bunch right but there's something wrong that the rest of science isn't like that so I think more of us should be like the geologists. Oh. You know. yeah. Ellen, we're getting we're getting a slight. Yeah, I'm getting. Stop. I don't know if the, everyone else watching is getting. There was a little bit there, of, uh, kind of a break in the uh, communication there. Uh, so we might drop you out and get you back in, but it may well be that it was fine for everyone else. It was, it, it yeah. was just me. I just, I just um, want to say one thing. To, I mean, I've been involved. I mean, I've been involved in lots of discussions about this, and I think we talked about this before, Helen. You know, field based geoscience is amazing. And field based science is amazing, but it does have accessibility issues, and there are issues to do with people having super expertise in lab-based things and the benefits that they may get from having gone in the field to see the samples collected. But it's very hard to do sometimes all of those things. And for some people, it's actually impossible. So what we need to do is what COVID has brought is opportunities to bring the lab or to bring the field into the lab and bring the field into the classroom with these virtual field trips. 
and therefore we open it up in a, in a much better way. And in fact, what we've seen with field teaching in geoscience during COVID is the lab being brought into the field. So you can have a virtual field trip where then you actually bring analytical data to people's desktops, which otherwise wouldn't be observable in the field, the spectra of some mineral that's been studied using, uh, you know, some, some lab equipment. So I do like this idea of trying to train holistically scientists by giving them very different experiences, I think. Uh, thank you. We're going to we'll move on to uh, the next question, Charlotte. This for, for I'll start with you on this, Tara. This uh, Charlotte's question kind of reminds me of Slavoj Žižek, the the philosopher who who said uh, uh, once, once he said it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. Um, and Charlotte just wants to first of all say you're doing a fantastic job at speaking up and informing people about climate change and driving sustainable innovations. But in the mean uh, economic system at the root of the ecological crisis, capitalism remains in place. What is your view on this, and what is the role? of scientists like yourself in political stroke economic discussions ah oh, that's a great question ah oh, that's a great question for a sunday afternoon she's you know <laughs> her breakfast on her lunch um thanks charlie um so i think it's about the how of capitalism i think the current form of capitalism that we have that is that has been all about profit and all about extracting what it can from the earth and from people at minimal cost um, is doomed to failure um, because we're just going to run out of resources, we're going to run out of people resource and natural resource in that system. But I think we could repurpose capitalism to have a higher purpose that was beyond profit, um, that looks at the contribution that you know business and companies make to the local communities, the communities along their supply chain, um, it would be um, a capitalism that's ready to pay for these things that we call externalities, but to pay for the pollution, to pay for the waste that they co that they create. And I get really, really excited thinking about new types of companies or our old companies repurposed around circular design thinking, where everything that you create and you innovate, you ask the question, well, where will the resources come from to make this? What can I reuse? What can I repurpose? Will someone, will someone use this as something that they buy and they keep? Or is it something that's a service to them or they rent it? Will they be able to share it with others? When, they, when it needs to be repaired, will, I, will there be a way to repair it? When it does no longer works, will there be a way to recycle it or make it into something else or compost it? And that, if I, was, if I was back being 18 again right now, I think it would be something around that that I would want to study, around how we're going to create a whole new way of manufacturing, a whole new way of doing business that's about a higher purpose than just making money. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's exciting. I think, you know, there's lots of young people that want jobs doing just that, um, jobs with a meaning. So, yeah, you still want a nice standard of living. You still want to be able to eat well, meet your friends, go on the odd holiday, of course. But I think there's absolutely, and we know that now, a way of doing that that um, is much more... Uh, respectful of the resources human and natural that have to go into making all those things brilliant thank you tara it's definitely um, for you helen because this is about oceans uh everyone else is allowed to join in but we always let helen have the ocean question first um are there bits of the ocean this is from matt by the way that are just empty no fish no algae no nothing i'm referring to areas more than uh just in the dark depth so is there anywhere where there is no, I mean, this is a hard thing, isn't it? As we've talked about before, the, there's so much exploration of the ocean still going on. There's so much that we, you know, to, to find out. Well, so th there's two things that come here. So first of all, if we think, think about the surface oceans first, just because they're the, the most obvious thing to think about, there are, there are effectively rainforests and deserts. And the rainforests are in places where two different water masses, so maybe warm water and cold water come together and they're, they're like the cities of the ocean. You get loads and loads of life, loads and loads of things going on. And then there are places that are in the, they're called oligotrophic gyres, which is a lovely word, but um, they're basically in, in the oceans of the world, there's normally a kind of merry-go-round going around one way or the other. The middle of that tends to be effectively a desert. It does have living things in it, but it's got fewer living things. And so there are these structures, even on the surface of the ocean, there, there are places, just, just like on land, there are places where lots of things grow and places where not so much grows. Now, the other question about whether it's empty comes back to, I have many, Tara hasn't even met half the bees in my body. This is another <laughs> um, and it's the thought that um, exploration is about uh, 
things you can draw on a map you can put across you can draw a map of a coastline you draw across and you go okay the thing is here and now i'm going to clear off whereas actually it's about a process so even in the places in the ocean where perhaps there isn't as much growing there are still things going on that are driving the engine of the planet so even in you know perhaps just underneath the oligotrophic gyres where um there isn't very much life it's maybe dark most of the time there is still enormous amounts of heat being transferred that are driving weather. There are still enormous uh, nutrient flows of other types moving things around the ocean. It's still you still have density changes caused by you know evaporation due to sunlight or salt coming from various places. You still got all these uh, mixing processes. So the thing is, there's still stuff happening. The engine of the ocean is still doing things, and I, I really think we need to get away from this idea of the ocean being about what's in it. Life is a part of the ocean engine. It's not a thing. It's not like the paint that sits on top of a canvas. It's part of the engine. And so even if there are places in the ocean where there isn't very much living, these other processes, the rest of the engine is still functioning. And so, so there's, a, there's a kind of perspective shift. I think there. So there might be areas, there definitely are areas of the ocean where there is there are fewer living things, but that does not mean that there is nothing of interest there or that they're somehow <laughs> dead places because it's incredibly dynamic. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and this uh move on to a question about from, uh, so this is a meteorology. Uh I love that so many people say this might be a flippant question. I think the moment you do climate change, people get very, very wary. Is this too flippant? But uh, uh Fletcher, this is an interesting question. He says, We can we why can't we control the weather? We can manipulate genes, smash protons at near the speed of light, but we can't make sure it doesn't rain on bank holiday Monday. <laughs> so who would like to take the weather question first? Tara, can I throw it to your Chris? Chris, yeah. I kind of well, I was going to say I wonder why he really, why he really wants to control it so much. You know, um, I love the fact that nature's bigger than us and that we might get surprises. You know, so I'm having a surprisingly beautiful warm day in Ireland. Chris is having an expectedly wet day <laughs> in Norway. Like you know, we we the climate does help us to predict what the weather is going to be like. That's what climate is. It's like that that longer term view of our weather. But imagine if you knew exactly what the weather was going to be every day. I think it would be really boring. Like I'm often glad that I live in a country where I have we have four seasons and we have one of the most dynamic and variable climates in the world. But it also means that it rarely rains all day. It probably rains maybe half the day and you might still get a beautiful hour in the evening. Um, but yes, of course, we are starting to look at how to manipulate the weather we want to mess around with the clouds we want to see if we can you know radiate more solar energy back back out to, into space we are looking at all kinds of wonky and crazy ways um which may not <laughs> seem so crazy 50 or 100 years from now but but some of that you know, brings us into really big ethical questions around the extent to which we control mother earth and um and with things that we don't fully understand and so what what I would love to do is continue to live with the uncertainty of our of our weather um, and do as much as we can to keep our climate what it is without having to resort to some of the the wackier, crazier, um, very expensive kind of solutions that are out there, which 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 perhaps will allow us to control the weather. But I, I get a little bit worried then that we're sort of man dominating over nature and that gets me into a worrisome place. I don't know. What do you think, Chris? <laughs> I, I, I just think I'd quite like to live in San Francisco. That's all I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> like, 23 degrees every day, and you know. It's know. Oh, it gets boring though. So well, I lived in La Jolla in California, and, and it was sunny. sunny, and it was sunny every day, um, and it really got to me because there were no seasons. And also, you know, they have problems <laughs> because they don't have rain, so they can't grow anything, and their water supplies are all over the place. And I was going to I mean, really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, I was just thinking about the ethics bit there, like the raining. Is there an argument, I mean, maybe Tara, again, that's what you're saying, what you picked up on there, Helen, about like areas where they may have, because you kind of said, Tara, I'd like to keep the weather like it is, but maybe we'd like to go back to when maybe there was less kind of crop failures related to really, really, you know, kind of anthropogenically driven dry periods. So could we make it, could we, could we democratise the control of the weather by allowing certain places to have a better... It depends on who owns the who the owns dial. the technology that creates the rain or seeds the clouds. 
Um, and will there will we have a United Nations type organization that that looks over that so that because if not, if it's created by one country or a private entity, they maybe use that for their own self interest. Perhaps they wouldn't be sending Can you imagine it. Imagine the world is created by or... committee. How awful would that be? <laughs> <laughs> Surely the worst thing the world could do to itself. Um, <laughs> yeah, unpredictability is a great thing because they tried, didn't they? They tried um, like breaking up. Uh, people have tried cloud seeding and breaking up hurricanes by I don't know blowing things up inside them or something. And it's never I don't know. It's a lot of effort. We've ended up with a very dystopian vision of the future there. So, uh, I mean, isn't it control? We we have certain warnings where very often it does end up being there was an old woman who swallowed a fly. Well, I thought swallowing the spider would actually sort that out, but it now seems to be that I have to swallow. Oh, now I'm having to swallow a cow. This, you know, there's always the idea. I mean, cane toads, I suppose, in Australia is one of the great examples where this will sort out this bit of nature. Ah, there are ramifications. <laughs> the chain has now changed, and thus. But Robin, one thing is for certain: we do have to think about it. Geoengineering, yeah. think about it. Geoengineering is going to be some part of the future, and so we do have to think about which parts of geoengineering we're going to accept ethically, scientifically, in terms of cost, and which ones are just too bonkers are too uncontrollable, are too unethical. But I think that's, that, that whole debate where we need to bring philosophers and ethicists to sit down with scientists and engineers, that, that's a really com- important conversation. It has started, it's not a big conversation yet, but the conversation has started and that's at least important. Well, if you could get it to rain frogs at some point, so I've in the Fortean read- Times, and it's in the film Magnolia as well, which is one of my favourites, so I just thought it would be an interesting experience. Chris, this is for you. This is from Juan. Juan would like to know, is the core of the Earth actually in the exact centre? Is it spherical? <laughs> I don't think he's a hollow Earth theorist, by the way. I don't think there's... Uh... Where's this one going? Well, I, well, I would say, is it in the centre of the Earth? Is the centre of the core in the centre of the Earth, I guess, is what the question is i would say i guess i'm i guess we should say yes but i'm guessing the answer is no right no he hasn't got an answer i mean this is this isn't a trick question this is i think it genuinely like so many illustrations that we grow up with sometimes we do get you know is this actually you know we see that image of how the earth and i think you're just interested to know is that basically how it works is it uh, yeah. as 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 symmetrical as as we've presumed from illustrations of it in the past what i'd say to one is it's nearer the center than it is the outside <laughs> right <laughs> and we know and i guess we know that from seismology from global seismology from the way we look at the ways um um sound waves travel through the earth and when you know there's an explosion on one side the, the time it takes for different types of waves to travel the earth and be recorded on the other side that's how we build up our understanding of the internal structure of the earth and so with that there's obviously some uncertainty about the velocity so the speed those sound waves are traveling and therefore how you then locate the different layer boundaries in the earth so i don't know what helen thinks as a physicist and i mean i guess there's some in precision in those ways of locating the layers in the earth and the outer core yeah we're getting better at it so you know because there's, there's, there's the basic things like discovering there was liquid in there and then discovering there was more solid in there and you can you can sort of get those bits right but it is really interesting that the, our only way of finding out about the inside of the earth is basically a side effect of something else yeah <laughs> um, and so you know you have to it's basically you know you get an earthquake over there and it just so happens that you you hit, get something else over there and you're kind of piecing yeah. the puzzle together and so it's really interesting because you can genuinely ask the question in the same way that we can't visit another star or another solar system we might never be able to visit the center of the earth right we haven't got any way to check so you can do all this interesting physics where you back calculate and then it sort of mm-hmm. matches what you get. And there's these details and they kind of you get a consistent picture and it sort of looks all right. But you, there is a limit. I mean, occasionally bits of it, Chris probably knows more, get, get chucked up to the surface and you do sample somewhere. But yeah. it's, it's, it must be a frustrating thing to do because you can't like it's, it's not that far away on the grand scheme of things considering the distances that people used to fly it's so straight down you know and, and yet you can't see what it's like so that's why i didn't you... become that kind of physicist i did do a course uh, on on that physics and then decided that i couldn't play with it <laughs> <laughs> well you can always read some edward 
uh, Lytton, who was the, one of the Hollow Earth. Uh, I think it's Vril, the coming of the race, uh, which is uh, dubious for many, many different reasons, but one of the great kind of uh, strange Hollow Earth uh, novels, uh, which possibly was confused at the time for uh, an idea of history. Um, this is a question from uh, Boyd, picking up from something Tams and Edwards talked about uh, a few months ago when we did uh, a, a similar Q&A. And uh, Boyd would just like to know, um, have we any more data now on whether the months of lockdown reduced traffic and flights etc made any difference whatsoever to climate stroke air quality i know a bit about that i don't know if tara knows more so basically the message is um well basically the message the message is that is yes and no so uh, it made a bit of a difference to traffic for example that reduced a bit of pollution but mostly the thing is that i and, and gary fuller dr gary fuller who was at um at Kings is now at Imperial says this a lot that you know when we think about pollution the thing that people think about changes with time so you know back in the 80s people thought about acid rain and then there's been you know and back further back than that it, during the great um the smogs in London people thought about factories and so air pollution has lots of different sources and traffic is only one of them so traffic pollution did go down but all the other kinds of pollution the sorts that are making you know that are generating energy for example or all that big fixed infrastructure that didn't change very much at all and so actually when everyone stayed at home what you look what you see is that you know, there was a little dip in carbon emissions from some sources, but fundamentally, it wasn't the traffic that was causing the bulk of the emissions. It was all these other things. So the traffic makes a contribution, but it's not the only thing. And actually, because it was spring, uh, there's ammonia that was put out on the fields. And so particulate pollution went up, but it went up because it's spring and um, because all the farmers carried on. So so. And, and, the, and the long term messages of, of the climate thing is that basically it's a drop in the ocean. These are big fixed systems. And everyone sitting inside for three months doesn't change the problem if, if after three months everyone goes completely back to normal so um so it's it's the reason it's rel relevant relevant to climate i think is that it shows just how much you can do things differently and yes it was horrible for lots of people for very valid reasons however the system could function like that it's, it's opened a gate to the imagination i think but in terms of you know have we now got some goods stored up in the piggy banks that so we can now kind of spend <laughs> our carbon credits basically it didn't make any difference at all so sorry but it can change you know yeah, brilliant. Great. Thank you. Helen. Tara, Question this is from KK59, uh, who would like to know if the government actually cared and we decided we were going to go for it tomorrow, how quickly could the UK switch to completely renewable energy? energy? Oh, I don't think if I know that to the precise year, but really quickly, you know, we could do by 2030, I imagine. Um, so energy in particular for electricity is like the easiest thing to do the transition. So we know how to produce wind energy and solar energy. Um, we are much better at balancing that renewable energy on our national grid now so that we reduce the risk of having any kind of failures or shortages. So, so that one certainly before 2030 is, is, is a possibility. Um, other things are more complicated. You know, one of the more complicated things is, is like I mean, air, airplanes we were just talking about. That's a much more difficult one to crack than, than electricity and energy. That one is, is pretty straightforward. We have all the technology. There's nothing holding us back. Um, here in Ireland, we thought we couldn't survive without this one big coal-fired power plant that we have in the middle of Ireland. And, and it's been shut down for... Uh, all kinds of reasons in the last while and most people haven't noticed and the grid has been fine because you know the renewable energy wind energy in particular has picked up the slack um so that one yeah is a quick fix there's nothing we're left to to, to figure out in that one Thank straight on to next question i'm going to try and get through uh all of them uh this is uh this is from john john would like to know uh chris in your interview with the guardian uh when it was announced you're one of the lecturers uh you this is something we've kind of mentioned a little bit but i think it would be nice to define a little bit more you casually threw out the phrase deep time can you explain what this is specifically <laughs> and scientifically because the best i've been able to come up with for my son that is ages ago <laughs> You know what? That appeals to my that level. Appeals to my level of sensibility and knowledge about what deep time means. It's the sort of thing I always think of it as. It wouldn't ever be on time team, um, because it's too old. <laughs> I mean, if I had to guess, that's what we talked about at the start here, prehistory, right? So maybe I'm not sure. Joining Tara and Helen here, but 
I just use deep time because I think it's one of the terms I probably read in the paper once, and it always puts me in a in a prehistorical frame of mind. It makes me start to think about the necessity of using the geological record for understanding what the Earth looked like before we were here and how it changed. And and I guess that's a very soft boundary I've given you there because I don't think any geologist could tell you what deep time means or when it started. But I don't know. Alan and Tara, do you have a Can sense I just uh, I just expand yeah. this a bit then? So then yeah. the thing in, in deep time, is it also about you know in, in historical time, a century we, we can talk about the enormous changes that might have happened a century. In deep time, is it also something about the length for change? So it's not merely about how far back we go, but also um what when we see noticeable and important change does that play any part of of, of the notion of deep time the notion so that, of deep time but, that, but that's to me has got to do with the resolution of the tools with which we're trying to determine something it says nothing about the rate of change of that process fundamentally just longer before the tools we're trying to use only allow us to work out whether something changed every 20 million years but the tools we use to look at something last week we can work it out to the second or something do you know what i mean like I don't think it's to do with the process. I just think it's got to do with, you know, a, a, a human-centred, or not centred, but we're at the, this end. It's looking back to the origins of the Earth. But I, again, I'm interested to know what is it a non geoscience science. Is it a good shorthand, like Pleistocene and all these other themes that people get lost and confused in? And so you say deep time and it's like all that stuff. Without everybody <laughs> names and what order they go in. Really? <laughs> well, well, as soon yeah. as, you know, so I'm spending these two days cycling along the Jurassic coast. So I've been, I started back in Exmouth in the bit where there are no fossils. And I'm worse. So maybe deep time is just all of the south coast of England. <laughs> it's those bits. Is it? I mean, deep time, there is that beautiful thing of seeing something like the Rift Valley and other places where uh, there is a, a sheer drop of, of that being an illustration. You know, when we look at that and when we can actually see the layers mm. and we realise how much each one of those layers, we've we begun to find out how many years that covers how many centuries how many millions of years that those kind of illustrations help people so that it doesn't merely become uh you know a, a, a term unanchored as such if that makes yeah. sense yeah it's like the 24 hour clock and you know our existence being in the last few our seconds being in the those, last few seconds i think those sorts of visual devices are useful and i think it may be you know what tara might talk about in her lecture having spoken to her about but like trying to get a bit of context to how maybe not important we are but in terms of the totality of the Earth system and the longevity of the Earth system, but then on the flip side, how much we're doing to change that. In the brief time we've been here, even though we're kind of inconsequential, we are having this huge effect. And, and I think that, 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 that visual metaphor is very useful to make us get back in our boxes a bit. <laughs> got the question um, which uh we were warned will take an hour of the show so i've deliberately waited until there's only nine minutes left um this is uh i should also mention by the way for everyone again if you can support us for our patreon that is magnificent if you are able to leave something in the tip jar that is tremendously useful as well if you're just enjoying the show i'm very glad as well that's that's all good stuff i should also add we've got some new things coming up very soon uh we're going to start doing as well as book shambles and sunday science q and every every week and show and tells as often as possible genetic shambles we're going to be doing a uh, uh, regular Tuesday um, kind of meet a scientist very often attached to a book that they've written and I think the first one's probably going to be uh, the brilliant Paul Nurse uh, who's currently the Crick Institute and indeed one of the reasons the Crick Institute exists such an, an incredible place doing amazing work at the moment uh, and uh, former um, president of the Royal Society and Nobel Prize winner he's going to be the first one talking about his book What is uh, Life which is a kind of in many ways a follow-up to, to what Schrodinger was uh, asking in Dublin in um over 70 years ago so this is the big question the question is from grant he says uh this might take up the whole hour but i'm curious if the panel can talk about what their key issues are with university rankings i understand things are a lot more complicated than any one list can provide but oh. are they of some use to prospective students at all oh. i sit back I will now allow the show to unravel before my eyes. Chris, would you like to begin? Chris, would you like to begin? No. <laughs> <laughs> Helen, Helen would, you would you like to take over from Chris? I will give the one sentence answer, which is the problem is there are lots of 
things that numbers don't measure and it doesn't work if you try to measure things in ways that are not appropriate and it's the first mistake of a lot of people who think they understand data but they don't and that's the problem it's that you're trying to measure the unmeasurable and once you turn it into a numbers game people play the game and they forget that actually that wasn't the point that's my short version um, people might be able to I, I expand on that Sarah, would you, if a, Chris is trying I not to in talk. University. Look at his face. <laughs> so I don't work in the university, so I'm 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 free to say what I want with it. But I think I think it's you can't it needs to be more holistic. If I'm if I was choosing now where I wanted to go to university, it is the the quality of the lecturers. Um for me I want those lecturers to be doing research. I want them to be passionate about what they're doing and sharing that with me. I want it to be a good student experience. I want it to be a rounded thing so that I I come out of it as a as a person who's able to question and have an opinion and support my opinion and and argue and use data and science and um and some of that might be because I'm challenged in a, in in a in a seminar, in a lecture situation, but it might also be in some of the extracurricular things that I do or the very experience of just being in university and joining clubs and societies. And so I would love the ranking to be on, if the objective is to turn out a well-rounded, ready for the world student at the end of the day, then that's what the, that's what the, the, the rankings need to reflect the ability of the university to create, to, to support uh, people to grow in that way and we don't do it it's 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 on two the number of variables that are measured and measured in this very quantitative way are too narrow whereas I think we need if we want if we want to have people who are going to be able to collaborate and work across disciplines and answer the problems and find the solutions to to the issues facing us today we, we can't have people working and thinking in silos and it kind of went measures and thinks and works in that way so I want it to try and capture the messiness that we need to create wonderful human beings um uh chris I'll, I'll give you another question then just to, uh, yeah, to I I, I, I only got five minutes that. left um, <laughs> no, he held back he missed his chance they're just completely nonsensical i mean if you go and look at the, if you go and look at the the actual kind of numeric and when you touched on this you look at the volatility in those league tables once you get below about the top five or six it's just complete garbage and um, you don't like the Guardian ranking the other day. They weren't even measuring the NSS scores, the National Student Surveys, as an input to the table. Oxford and Cambridge didn't even return. They don't return those numbers. And so they've got an NA in the columns, and yet they're top of the table. And you can argue about whether you think the NSS is a good way to assess the quality of teaching. And I would, I would criticise it that it doesn't do that very well. But to not, I mean, it's, I can't even bring myself to talk about it without getting really upset because it perverts so much of what we want to do, like Tara said, in educating young adults. It, it, it you know, you metricize something, it becomes a target. Oh, he vanished. You can sort of, you can sort of, he got so worked up, he made his ears hot. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can, you, you, you make people, like, so people were talking about this, like, this, let's, let's, let's measure inclusivity in universities and let this, like, be some sort of, you know, weighted thing in this this table. And that, what we're going to do is we're going to measure how many BAME students, Black, Asian, minority, ethnic students there are in our university, because that will tell us. So what do you think the university managers might go and do? Just start admitting loads of people and then putting them in this really terrible situation with contextual offers and not looking after them when they're there. But they, they will climb the rankings. I mean, how awful what is was that? Brilliant. There was a there was a brilliant moment on all of this where it was a couple of years ago and one of the, um, we can all have this round for a long time, we probably shouldn't, but there was this brilliant thing where, where they said, one of the university ranking people said, we want to measure the nuances of universities and we want to, you know, capture all of this stuff. And they had this whole spiel about nuance. And then they said, and we're going to categorise them into A, B, C. And you're like, oh, that was the <laughs> right there, you just... That is the problem. <laughs> and that is the problem. Is it's not as if you give people a game to play, they play the game instead of do it fixing the problem. 
Um, well, I think this is. A, um, we could do a show on rather than we won't do it Sunday science Q and A. But if, if if any of you would like to uh, come back, we will do uh, a, a, one evening. Uh, I think it'd be quite an interesting thing to actually do a session about the problems uh, of this for a lot of people who are, you know, maybe not go, not in further education yet. Think about further education, all of those kind of things. I think that'd be very useful. So, uh, with the two minutes we've got left, uh, Joanne would like to say congratulations to all of you for uh, the Christmas lecture this year for that opportunity. Uh, Joanne would like to know, um, is there anything that's kind of had to go into the bin in terms of your ideas because the audience won't be, it won't be the same audience scenario as usual? I presume, in fact, by the time, it, because this situation has been there for such a long time, uh, maybe you hadn't even necessarily been thinking about how you would be using the audience. But yes, over to you. Actually, we don't know. Actually, we don't know. I think they're waiting for a government announcement in a couple of weeks that will say more about live performance spaces. Is that that was the last I heard? I don't know if Chris. Yeah. So we're not allowed to say a lot, but basically, I think they're waiting to. There's still information we don't have. Yeah. That it'll be different. That it'll be different. It will be different. We won't be able to be. Um, as hands-on in demonstrations with the audience as one would have been in the past. Um, there is just a whole new um, challenge for us to rise to. But it's very exciting though, isn't it? Isn't it? We've talked about the opportunity to get the science outside of the Faraday lecture theatre, right? There's an opportunity where we're forced maybe into people's homes digitally, we're forced onto the streets outside the RI so we can do something socially distanced, measuring air quality or something like pick it. Okay, there's loads of super cool things we can do to kind of make the science look and feel different to what we did before. So, you know, I'm super chuffed about what it might look like. That's interesting. That reminds me of the rather, the, I don't know if any, rather excellent uh, idea, soap box science. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, taking science out into the streets. It sounds like that some of the things that they've done, that can feed back into yes. possibilities as well. Anyone watching this, go and look up what soap box science do. There's some, some really brilliant things. Um, quick one for you, Helen. Uh, this is from uh, Asley, I think, who would like to know, uh, I really enjoyed your last book. Are you writing another one? Well, I am. I am. Um, um, although it's kind of been slowed down quite a lot by, you know, pandemics and the nightmare that working in a university is. So, yes, I'm writing the one. It's about how the ocean works. But I haven't done any work on it for the past six months because I have been helping my department to cope with <laughs> the consequences of many things recently. So, so yes, but it's, it won't be imminent. Sorry. <laughs> Well, um, thank you all very much. I'm sorry, sorry by the way, a question about uh, NGOs and profit loss. And Karen, I'm really sorry we didn't have time for that. I think it was a question that needed a, a decent length of answer. And I will put that, hopefully, we're going to be coming back to this subject, obviously, in the next few months. And Karen, we will ask your question. Uh, Neil, as well, had a question about your uh, Easter series, um, Helen. And uh, we will stick that in next week as you're going to be back next week. Um, thank you very much to Chris, Tara. As I said, Helen and, and I will be back at uh, three o'clock next week there's loads of stuff going on as well on the shambles site i think not sure if it's going to be next week but we are going to be talking to ruby wax tomorrow about her new book that'll be up on book shambles soon as i said genetic shambles will be uh live on wednesday at uh, 8 30 in the evening uh lots of other stuff coming up thank you very much to trent burton thank you everyone who was able to contribute whether that's for a question uh or putting something in the tip jar or joining us for our patreon uh, or just basically taking part in any way whatsoever uh we'll see you next week bye bye